a talk for 15 minutes, how do we really get to um, the depth of how serious this crisis is, as well as what are some ways that we can bring resolution? I'm going to attempt to do that in the 15 minutes that I have, but I think a lot of the work is going to happen in our Q&A section. So I'm super excited for everyone who joined us today in this space. I start with something that's very important to me, and that's disclosures. First, of course, we need to always recognize the ways that money um, really do drive research agendas and access to um, the ways that certain voices are amplified. However, financial disclosures alone aren't the only part that really impact the ways that we connect and perceive and understand knowledge. So I disclose that I come to this conversation as a Black woman. You may observe me and know that already. However, I invite you to lean away from that assumption of looking at someone and understanding their identity based on an appearance. I'm also a descendant of enslaved people with inherited resiliency. I'm a cisgender woman. I'm a first generation college student. I'm the wife of a black man. I'm the mother of two children, hopefully who will be quiet during this webinar, but you may hear them. Um, and I will leave with that point that I value um, and support many different ways of knowing. And so with that being my value throughout this presentation, I will be using QR codes. And I use QR codes, one, um, because I've been to a billion different trainings and webinars, and I say I'll look up something later, and then I don't. But also because although we value academic and scholarly knowledge, we also have to recognize when we talk about racism, prejudice, and bias, many voices are silenced. And whose voice is allowed to say, this is substantial, this is valid, um, is often not the very people that have been hurt. So I'll be using QR codes that are both from academic knowledge, but also that are from community knowledge, because there are many different ways that we're going to have to approach this to come to an understanding of reducing um, racism, prejudice, and bias. Racism is everywhere. Um, we see it in schools, in our workplaces, in our businesses, in our religious organizations, in medicine, in our relationships, in our government. And if you don't really see what I'm talking about, here are just a few examples. So in the academy, if we think about academic inequity, we see overplacement of children in special education services, we see crowded classrooms, it's teachers with less experience in certain um, school systems. We know that the New York City school system is one of the most segregated, if not the most, um, in our country. We see expulsions and suspensions that are anchored in individual children's racial and ethnic identity. In medicine, we see horrific rates of maternal mortality. We see this in COVID-19 death rates in our housing. There are questions around quality, location, home ownership, and employment. Um, inequitable salaries, promotions, and hiring, even in our legal system, um, rather than the criminal justice system, the criminal legal system, we see issues re related to sentencing, death policies, um, and policing. And so this idea that racism is everywhere doesn't just start on a societal level. It actually starts very, very young. We see babies as young as three months old showing a preference for the faces of caregivers that match, um, for their caregivers that match the same racial and ethnic identity. And so young babies at a young age, at three months, are able to recognize race. We see children as young as two years old start to reason about behavior based on race. At about two and a half, we see children starting to choose their playmates based on race. And at five years old, we see our white children um, really selecting playmates based on race. And five, at five years old, children start to associate certain groups with higher statuses related to race. And as horrifying as all of these numbers are, the thing that really drives me is knowing that explicit conversations with young children within a week start to shift their racial attitudes. And so these conversations are critical to be having with our youth, but also they show up in so many other places because of the stories we tell. In this study, this idea of how racism, prejudice, and bias shows up for young children has been a narrative and research that we have seen for decades. So Clark and Clark in 47 um, identified through the Dahl study the ways that racism is linked to self-esteem, um, to self-worth, um, to values. And then we see many scholars replicating these studies. And these two images are two um, projective tests where children are asked what's happening in the picture. 
And in the study, what we see is when the, the little white girl is standing behind the swing, um, children project that she is helping Abby, who's on the ground up. In the other image where Brenda is standing behind the fly or the swing, um, children say that Brenda pushed Sarah. So children, even at a very young age, start to make stories and narratives uh, about race and about behavior. And these stories over time become the truth. You know, is there a difference between perception and reality if it's your understanding of the world? And that truth becomes the justification for many of the egregious things that we have um, in our society. And then that story becomes invisible. And we're not even aware that we're telling this story anymore that is anchored in racism, prejudice, and bias. And so when I bring this issue up of humanitarian work, why is this so important? What is a humanitarian? This is a really short video where we really ask um, this uh, interviews from the UN where they ask people, what is a humanitarian? Humanitarian is a person who sees beyond any kind of race or religion. We need more people like them. A lot more people like them. Being kind to other people, respecting their rights, especially. Somebody who genuinely wants to help. Doing things for your fellow man. Someone who thinks about the human needs and survival of the human race above all. Um, Maybe like a global citizen, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Selfless and thoughtful about um, uh, the well-being of other people. They want to make the world better. It means the love of humanity. That's what it means, right? And so when we think about humanitarian work in the context of racism, you know, a humanitarian emergency is an event or a series of events that represent a critical threat to health, safety, security, and well-being for a group of people. And racism very much meets this criteria. And so why is it so important to declare that racism is a humanitarian crisis? First and foremost, it allows us to focus on the systems and the structures that create racism, rather than dismissing um, inequities as the fault of individuals. It also recognizes the long-standing history in the United States um, that permeates across the entire world in every single institution. And so because we become professionals, because we decide to go to school, it does not negate that social learning from that three month old baby and those early experiences in school. In fact, becoming a professional actually makes us more vulnerable to these issues that come up from racism and prejudice and bias related to our resources and power. More specifically, when we challenge ideas of what racism is and what it looks like, um, when we challenge concepts like white toxicity, also known as white supremacy, um, I prefer the term white toxicity. White supremacy to me actually perpetuates white supremacy. There's nothing supreme about it. And white toxicity allows us to all, not just people of color, to really recognize the ways that concepts of whiteness can directly impact each other. Um, more specifically, white toxicity refers to the ways that whiteness as a concept is used to determine the appropriate affective, behavioral, cognitive ways that people are to be. The ways that everyone is compared, resourced, and then harmed if they do not meet these standards. And so these resources and power show up in areas related to resources in the professional space, conflict and worries about offending people, worries about being labeled, not knowing what to say when you see racism, worrying about sounding uneducated, being embarrassed, feeling shame. But when we think about power, the intersection of the ways that you worry that you may be fired, humiliated, your reputation ruined, you may be harassed, assaulted, and even killed. And so when we talk about the humanitarian crisis of racism, it's critical that we recognize the resources and the power. Now, what do we do about all of this? For many of you, you may already say, I knew all of that, I already know about this. Yes, it's a humanitarian crisis, but what do we do? And so for years, I experienced racism as a young person in the classroom, 
I experienced racism um, as just a person navigating the world. And when I started training as a psychologist, I even noticed it in the therapy room and in my own supervision experiences. And so I became fascinated with what does it mean to decide that you want to dismantle racism when you are well-intentioned, when you're not the image of racism that many of us have seen, those black and white images of a dog attacking someone, but instead, when well-meaning, well-intended, well-intentioned people still engage in this humanitarian crisis. And so the Crawford Bias Reduction Theory and Training in CBRT is really about having a systematic approach to understanding and making the story that becomes invisible more visible. And so it's three major pieces. One is the awareness of the origins of bias, prejudice, and racism, and really the socially transmitted disease that we are all infected with, that is racism. The next is the investigation. What triggers our racism, prejudice, and bias, and what does it look like when it shows up? And lastly, how do we reduce the impact, not the intention, but the impact of individual, interpersonal, and systematic racism? When we think about what gets triggered and what, get, what gets activated, Experiencing racism is really difficult. It's very painful. It's disorienting. And so there are also, there are many different systems that get activated. The first is affectively in our emotions. It triggers fear, anger, anxiety, sadness, and for some even excitement. Behaviorally, it shows up in us yawning, having fatigue. Many of us are time impoverished and just don't have the, the energy to engage this. It shows up cognitively. And when we start to have judgments about people and labeling their, them a terrible person if they engage and say things that are racist or prejudiced or biased, it brings us to flashbacks in our own lives, in our own childhood and experiences we've had. And it also leads to excessive curiosity where we start to view people as a caricature of their true self. And lastly, physiologically, it impacts our bodies. Our hearts start pounding, our mouths get dry, our muscles get tense, and all of these ABCPs are signs that racism, prejudice, and bias are present. And when that happens, we have to cope. And there are three different ways that we cope that do not dismantle racism. The first is we avoid. We just withdraw, we disconnect, we silence, we use inappropriate humor, and we shift the focus. Instead of talking about racism, we talk about other marginalized identities like gender or about, or about LGBTQI identities. These things that do not dismantle racism, but we're trying to cope, so we just kind of avoid. The next, for some of us, we go into superhero mode where we have this exaggerated sense of responsibility. You go to every training, you're in every single workshop, you're on every committee, and you burn out. You burn out and you get crispy and you can't endure. The last is we go into this critic mode and we move against the thing that is activating us and we get angry and irritable and we have heated arguments and we're CCing people on emails that don't need to be involved and we diagnose, oh, you know, you're bipolar and we're not even mental health professionals. All of these things to cope with those affective, behavioral, cognitive and physiological activations. And so what the Crawford Bias Reduction Theory and Training challenges us to do is to have that awareness of the ways that we all have this socially transmitted disease and how that is linked to our resources to fear and power, to recognize our ABCPs, and to recognize also how we're coping in ways that do not dismantle or change the world and really do not change this humanitarian crisis. Um, the next is an investigation, and that's wonderful to understand what it looks like individually, interpersonally, and institutionally, but that's not going to change the world. We've all lived through enough um, experiences where the cultural consciousness waves have happened. Last summer, it was Breonna Taylor. Before that, it was Eric Gardner. Before that, it was Emmett Till. And so what will change? Why will this moment be different? How will we really address this humanitarian crisis? The goal is to be able to cross that bias boundary, to manage our affective, behavioral, cognitive, and physiological reactions, to reduce our unhelpful coping, to be able to move from our minds feeling so full of all of this stuff that is so painful, to be able to be mindful and engage in strategic approaches. And so let up is a mnemonic for us to internally regulate ourselves. It's an internalized processing model to really help us regulate those ABCPs. 
Um, and it stands for listening to what activates you, empathizing with yourself so you understand your own pain and you do not have to um, center yourself in someone else's journey, but you understand your own experiences with racism, prejudice, and bias. It's then deciding if you're gonna tell your story or to teach and educate around these concepts of racism and really start to get into this humanitarian work. It's understanding the larger picture. When you come into a room, it's not just you into that room. It's just not you as an individual. It's you and your entire crew of social identity. And then lastly, it's psychoeducation or planning what you're gonna do to make it really clear that when racism shows up, you are not gonna collude. You will not remain silent. You will not pretend like it's not there. It is an elephant in the room and you see it, you name it and you point it out. And so my goal in CBRT is to really help people see that even though this work is so uncomfortable, even when you're uncomfortable, you are capable. And so there's some data um, because of course we need to see is there evidence. So this is just a simple pre-post assessment and what I have seen in hundreds at this point, thousands of people engaging in the CBRT approach is that I've seen an increase in confidence in people's ability to communicate with patients, um, the ability to correct culturally awkward interactions and to repair those cultural ruptures, to recognize when disparities have occurred and also to advocate for patients and disempowered colleagues. Um, and there are many different ways that I deliver the CBRT training. Um, it's as short as uh, five minutes, and, or as short as, sorry, that was my marker, as short as uh, intervention in an hour long training, as long as two years long. And so this is the abbreviated version. And what I've seen is there is a pre-post change that people, when they enter into the CBRT work, um, at the end of the journey, there is a change in all of the markers that I discussed. Um, there's also change if they do a full day with me. If this is an eight hour training or if it's a two year training, there is change that is significant in their ability to recognize the awareness, the investigation and the reduction. And actually, you know, this is not the best business model. There's no difference if people engage in um, an abbreviated version of CBRT or a full day training, no difference. Just going through the process um, is a changing experience. But I'm a qualitative researcher, and so I love those numbers, but to me, words ring true. Um, and the majority of feedback, and this is just at thousands of these, these are just some quotes about what people have said through the experience. They feel more prepared to discuss the challenging, disrespectful language they've experienced with adolescents, um, feeling like this isn't a model that's just for one setting, but is a, a model that can go anywhere in the world. Um, some people have said that this is one of the best multicultural trainings that they've gone through. And even for individuals who have done this work for years, um, still being able to recognize and identify many hidden biases that they were not aware of. Um, other things that people have said is that the experiential exercises are really useful. The CBRT model is really about moving our jaw. You can watch a thousand trainings, but if you don't actually move your jaw and engage in this work, change is not gonna happen. You are not gonna cross that bias boundary and you're not gonna be able to do this humanitarian work. And so some of the critical feedback, because it's not all rainbows and butterflies, um, is that it needs to be longer. It doesn't matter how long I do this training, everyone says, I wish it was more time, even though the research shows that there's no difference um, in doing it as a full day or an abbreviated training. Some people say that the work is really triggering for them. Um, and the last comment is that, you know, ideas around race being a social construct, and we do recognize that race is a social construct, but it has very real biological, educational, medical, and so forth ramifications. Um, and so, you know, my invitation that I leave you with is when you look back at this point in your life, what will you say about your humanity? How did you show up? Did you engage in the humanitarian work that so many beautiful New Yorkers said in that video, it's about understanding other people. It's about connecting. It's about seeing the needs and showing up for people. Um, and so I look forward to your questions and your comments. These are all the other spaces that you can find me in. And with that, thank you so very much for your time.